Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the No Laying Up podcast. Solly here. I am, of course, joined by our guy, Mr. Kevin Van Valkenburg, here to... What are, what are we here to do today, Kevin? I mean, it's people have already clicked on the podcast episode. They see the title, but tell us what we're about to do. 1996, the year I graduated from high school. <laughs> we are ready to throw it back. Would you consider yourself to be a... You know, were you a golf fan in 1996? Uh, I would say only marginally. I certainly was aware of it. Uh, my parents were watching it, but it was not like appointment television for me. I have some recollection of, uh, certainly of the Masters this year, uh, is hard to culturally escape. But I was trying to think about my other uh, one with the Open Championship, which I've drawn here. And I have very vague recollection of it. Maybe one shot that I could sort of, when I, I watched a little bit of the replay today, I thought, oh, I think I remember watching that live. So that's uh, one more than I remember from the 1996 open championship. If you're, uh, if you're new to these episodes, we've done a few of these years in the past. I don't remember all the ones we've done. I know we skipped 1994. I think it was, but most recently did 1995. Uh, try to get to one, mm -hmm. one of these a quarter, I think just to kind of, they're always fun to go look back and, uh, watch old film, watch old tape, read old storylines. Big fun I had in this go around was reading some of the writing and just like the, the tropes that were used in the 1990s to describe <laughs> sports made me laugh really, really hard. We um, we didn't arm wrestle for this one, but 1996 has a very clear winner for which one was the most interesting major. And uh, yes. being the benevolent person that I am, I, I decided to You're so I decided kind. to gift you with the 1996 Masters. I think before we get there. I want to play a little game with you, if you will. Oh, I love You're the You're going to go to the world rankings to start 1996. And okay. uh, I am going to, we're going to go one by one. I'm going to ask you whether or not you think this person would have gone to live if it existed in 1996. <laughs> yes. <laughs> love this game. Already. We're going to do the top okay. 20. Okay. First one okay. could yeah. not be easier. Absolute alley-oop. 360 windmill dunk do i even need to say the name and do you have your answer gregory norman uh would would one million percent have gone to live <laughs> pretty hard to argue any other uh scenario in which he would have uh was in fact essentially trying to create a live was looking around passing his corn cob hat to, uh, hopefully for money to go start a new tour at this point but uh i was you know what i'll say this before we move on to him number one player in the world was a little bit surprised to read that he was 41 years yeah. old maybe it just feels like a way that the game has evolved a little bit that like he was still seen as like the dominant force and was 41 yeah. like can you imagine right now the number one player by far and away being 41 years old not unless it was tiger like and he's a way past that already now so well that's a, a one of the most fun i don't know things i've i've learned throughout this process or enjoyed throughout going back through these old majors is just like hey we remember who won and if you had a, like a choke job we remember probably the choke job but seeing the constants right the ones that were there for like mm -hmm. a lot of them that we have no memories of blah 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 at this major but of course norman was there no memories of norman mm -hmm. at this major but of course he was there he was there at this he was just there so much in this period that we've dove into and i, I a lot of a lot of different names pop up in a lot of these that we're going to get to that uh it's a constant theme throughout the 90s that you know you don't re really remember 25 years later almost but uh, the rest of the list is actually kind of hard. I, I, I don't think I know these personalities enough to get there, but uh, Nick Price, is he going to live or not? Um, I think yes. Uh, Norman's closest buddy on tour at the time, uh, obviously showed some you know willingness to sort of, I mean, he's from South Africa or from Zimbabwe, but like played in South Africa during the whole apartheid stuff. So I would say yes, uh, not, he would probably be one of the live dudes who was basically like, yeah, mate, like I'm playing, but I'm not going to like talk. I'm not going to like, you know, f screw over the, you know, uh, European tour or the, the PJ tour or bad mouth and whatever. I'm just going to go and make my money and I'm good. So, uh, Ernie Els. Um, it's hard to do this gosh. because, uh, obviously these dudes have aged since 1996 and yeah. so many dudes that did end up in the first wave with live were the guys in their forties. And oh, I've pictured guys. these guys yeah. as being in their forties, but we're talking when you're number two, number three in the world, Ernie Els is three years off winning the U S open two years off winning the U S mm -hmm. open, uh, in 94. Um, I'm gonna say no. Like, I just don't, I think he's, I, I, I'm gonna say no. 
I think I agree with that. I think I agree with that. I think it's interesting though. It's also because what's hard to parse is Ernie Els probably at this point is not playing on the PGA tour a lot, right? right. Like he's probably playing mostly in Europe still, uh, coming over for the majors, but it's not like he's, you know, he may come over for Doral or may come over for the Memorial or something like that, but his life isn't entirely on the PGA tour. So maybe he could be sort of seen as like, oh, it doesn't make that much difference to me. Uh, yeah, I would say that's a 50, 50 toss up for me. And I don't, I, I'd say this and mostly I don't want to like, if I say yes, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean I'm like shitting on that person and like saying something about their character, but, uh, with the Dells, I'll just say, uh, you know, up in the air. Okay. Do. We got to move a little quicker through these Bernard longer staying or going. Uh, going. I think he's staying. I think he's playing European tour. He was so he was so okay. Ryder Cup centric again, and and yeah, there's a lot stronger European tour ties with a lot of these Europeans at this That's time. True. That I I think he's staying. Uh, Corey, Pay if you had to, if you lose the chance to play in the Ryder yeah. Cup at this point, you'd probably leaning or whatever. Corey, Corey Pavin, Pavin, I think he's no, I think he's, he's staying. Going. He's staying. Monty, I think he's staying. I think he's staying yeah. too. I think he's so. Oh, I don't understand what this live thing is. This is absolutely it's abominable. A, it's a wonderful idea. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, I don't, I've, I've known a lot of Saudis, are lovely people. Uh, Nick Faldo. I think he's staying. Uh, I think he probably stays. Yeah, he wants to be involved in the Ryder Cup stuff, and he's he's got his girlfriend in Arizona at this point. He doesn't want to, you know, <laughs> drag her around the Middle East. <laughs> Moving up, Fred Couples. <laughs> Uh, he does not he does go. Not, he stays. No. He's Jumbo Ozaki. Sure. I mean, he's just manipulating yeah, yeah, from the Jumbo Japanese <laughs> door. But uh, Steve Elkington. See ya. Yeah, he's yeah. gone. He's in fact, he's probably one of the people talking a bunch of shit. Like he's just like, yep. you know, why, why don't you go in my it's old goal. He's the mate. Pat Perez uh, of this era, yes. I think, but the much better resume, of course. But yes. uh Tom Lehman, Lauren Roberts. Uh, I don't think either one are. I don't going. think so either. Jose Maria. Um, I think so. I did make an argument in the mailbag recently that Seve would have gone to live, uh, which I didn't think about the Ryder Cup when I made that argument, but I just sort of <laughs> felt like Seve was constantly pissed off yeah. at the European tour. So I think if Seve goes, then Jose Maria goes, and they're sort okay. of so like it know, depends on Seve then, and which in '96 yes. that might have been when when did Seve die? 2011. He uh, so '96 his game was kind of gone by then. Do I remember yeah. right? Is, it, yeah. it, I, mm -hmm. That could be a little early in that timeline, but he's not. He's not been a in all these majors we've dove in on. He's not been a part of. But if that's the case, no. he definitely would have gone. And I don't know if Seve, if if Jose Maria would have gone with him, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sam Torrance, I'm saying no. Um, Ryder Cup captaincy was yeah, pending. Short, I mean, same with Stenson. But uh, anyways, let's let's get into let's get into the majors now at this point. But it's a fun <laughs> it's a fun experiment. I don't know. Again, I Very fun I don't game. know these guys well enough to uh, to uh, to guess, but it's fun to guess on. But uh, we should play this game again in like five years. <laughs> we, uh, the, <laughs> well, those guys all did right. end up going. But all right, take us to the 1996 yeah. Masters. What happened there? The 1996 Masters. So as we um, talked about, Greg Norman, the number one player in the world, uh, has been the number one player in the world for a long ass time at this point. Uh, still like the straw that stirs the drink in a lot of uh, major conversations. Uh, everybody sort of thinks like he's destined to win a Masters, uh, which as we've learned over history, like no one is destined to win a Masters that... Uh, I always think of when, like when Tiger said this year, oh, Roy's going to win a bunch of these. Like, ah, I don't, I don't know that that works like that. You know, it, just because your game uh, suits the Masters does not necessarily mean that uh, it's going to work out for you. It haunts certain players over time. Uh, but he's still the big time favorite. Everybody sort of assumes. Weirdly, though, as I found, uh, Greg Norman coming into this Masters misses two cuts in a row for the first time do you know how many other times that happened in his pga tour career to, prior to that point uh one it had never so, happened did you just i think you just Norman. said for the first time actually I okay sorry <laughs> I I gave also, away. Gave you away. didn't notice you said it neither did i but yes <laughs> <laughs> all right so norman had never missed two cuts in a row prior That's what to, i thought it was a trick uh, question i was like wait a second yeah that's yeah, definitely uh, me pulling some tricks on you out there. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of an interesting, maybe a hint that uh, his game was not actually like uh, in the best of shape. Um, in, that, in fact, the Wednesday of the Masters that year, 
uh, Norman woke up and his back right. hurt so much that he could not even really swing a club and he didn't know what to do. Like, wasn't sure really. What, and Fred couples heard kind of like from a friend on the range or whatever. Hey man, I heard your back is hurting a little bit. I'm going to send my back specialist over there uh, and I'm going to get you fixed up just right. And so that was a big sort of, uh, you know, I guess gift in some ways that, that, uh, you know, Freddie for years had trouble with his back. He honestly, it's all year. A lot of guys having back trouble in this mm. era. Not sure. Like they were restricting that hip turn. What's going on. They needed to lift the left heel a little bit, but a lot of back injuries in this era, probably because they weren't doing any, they weren't work. athletes back probably. then. Yeah. <laughs> they were just kind of moseying through. So when, uh, Norman, maybe it was uh, harder with... to rotate through when you had those metal spikes that were stuck in the ground, who knows? <laughs> So when Norman uh, famously opens with a ties the course record uh, with a 63, Fred Couples' fiance uh, says to him and to the press, well, you sure picked a great time to, you know, help out Greg Norman, man, because, uh, you know, Freddie was also like the, the, the second favorite uh, in this one. <laughs> Which is interesting, so we... right? To yes. like run over to like uh, help a competitor that much on the day before the Masters, like, it's uh i'm not saying we'll get to we had an incident in, like that in uh oakland hills as well which we'll get to but that's okay. it's interesting. just interesting i'm not saying it's right or wrong it just kind of speaks to how golf works it's a traveling kind of friendship circus circle whatever but that's just very interesting yeah so i'm actually a little bit sad that we can't play our usual game here of i name the person uh and you have to come up with their last name because it's only big hitters really on the, the leaderboard the first day there's literally no one except for one person who i could name that i don't think that you could get their name and i'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there english golfer and i think you might even know it anyways david does that ring david a bell Gilford? To you at all? that's yeah. right uh, you may have remember him from your Ryder cup that's pod right. uh, about the war on the shore who uh, he played on a couple of Ryder Cup teams and actually uh, went 2-0 and in that War on the Shore Ryder Cup. Uh, Six-time Euro Tour winner. He opens uh, with a 66. Mm. But uh, so Greg Norman, obviously, is the, our first-round leader, uh, just tears up the course. Everybody's like, oh, my God, this this is the the year. Greg's going to do it. He's, he's amazing. Uh, Phil Mickelson opens with a 65 as well. Really feels like first like uh i'm gonna sort of storm into contention in one of these masters uh, he's got to so, be close to winning a major at this point right he's got to be got to so be close. man there's yeah it'll be it'll be any day now uh a couple notes before we just sort of get into the main event here uh tom watson five putts the 16th green on on thursday Unlucky. not sure how that's possible yeah just a tough one uh ray ray floyd uh makes a hole in one at the masters on 16 with a five iron. Love that. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of why we're covering this era as well. It's a little different yeah. ball game. Roll back the ball. Uh, our man, Tiger Woods, just about to turn professional later this year, shoots an opening round 75 and follows it up with another 75. Uh, he insists he is not going to turn professional. Uh, in fact, he points out that he has an economics paper due uh, on Wednesday that he needs to get working on at Stanford. So he's not all that bummed. He says, my plans have not changed. I went to college to get an education. That's the most important. Uh, Earl says that if Tiger does ever turn pro, <laughs> that people can blame the NCAA for their prying ways. Because uh, earlier in the week, Arnold Palmer had bought Tiger dinner mm -hmm. and Tiger had to mail Arnie a $25 check because otherwise it would be deemed an improper benefit and he might lose his eligibility at Stanford. Sounds like Tiger could have written an economics class about one, about that in the NIL, and two, about the effect he's about to have on professional golf. Yes. Uh, Tiger here says, uh, as I love this quote. Uh, I got this from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, Everybody sees the millions of dollars out there that I'm supposed to be turning my back on. But what happens if I go pro and I don't do well? I'll have no place to play. What am I going to do? Go to Asia? <laughs> This is the problem. This is not the Tiger Woods voice of 96. He's like a lot higher pitched at this time. I know, it's, I know. We, we're we're, we're kind of one trick uh, ponies with the Tiger voice, though. I don't have true. the Tiger 96 voice handy. He was yes. a lot more loquacious back then, just a lot more like he curious, was. a lot more like excited to talk. He's not beaten down by talking to media yet. This is true. And very much like a, a soft, I mean, we've talked about this before, sort of a soft lilt, kind of more of in the Michael Jackson yeah. uh, molds. Uh, so uh, I, I've done that tiger in the past in our pods. Uh, it's, you know, a little bit nervous about bringing it out again without practicing. <laughs> uh, 
Um, anyway, Norman, so Norman follows it up uh, on the next day, shoots 69, uh, feels like, oh my gosh, things are going great. Uh, four shot lead uh, the next day, uh, hanging around Nick Faldo uh, in second. Nick Faldo through went 69, 67. Uh, some other names sort of of relevance of this era, David Frost uh, and Phil Mickelson then follows up his first round 65 with a 73. Also kind of hovering on the leaderboard, Lee Jansen, Bob Tway, Scott Hoke, Scott McCarron, VJ making an appearance. He'll show up later in the uh, Open Championship. And then Corey Pavin and Ian Woosnam. So pretty much like a, a memorable cast of hitters. Like nothing That's the too, 90s right um, there. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So nothing too great. Uh, just one other note I forgot to mention on Tiger. Uh, once again, led the field in driving distance. It's remarkable how long Tiger was back then. Like honestly, longer than he was in his prime. Uh, averaging 342 off the tee. Uh, Jesus. Was hitting it. People were giving Don, John Daly shit because Tiger was hitting it 30, 40 yards past John with Daly. A, it's now, with a ballada, too. This is, yeah. Yes. Yes. Could not really control it. Uh, was hitting it all over and especially had distance problems with his irons and stuff. But, like, if you watch those clips of him, like, the way that he – his hips move so fucking fast. Like, it's unbelievable how uh, quickly he can sort of get through to the ball. Uh, so – Weirdly, just another couple like goofy notes. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, Sully, but Ray's Creek used to be like a river. Like it used to be like raised all the way up. So basically like any ball that landed short was getting sunk into the river and like carried away. This was the first year that they drained it down to be like a creek. Uh, and guys were actually playing like out of uh, the creek and making, uh, you know, getting up and down and making birdies. Michael Campbell was sort of the first guy to sort of do this that year. Uh, hit a six iron in the hazard and was able to basically, it was like half submerged and he blasted to 10 feet and made a putt, uh, which I just thought was kind of an interesting historical thing of like, you know, the Masters is constantly changing. Uh, and um, I always thought you know, that was just, just based the on the rain. Where, like I've, I remember going back and watching yeah. highlights based, you know, I, I never really thought about when they actually uh, drained it and turned it into that. Mm. Yeah. Nothing apparently, Augusta, is based on the elements. True. They control <laughs> all true. of it. So, uh, of that tree uh, so, falling down. <laughs> Did they test the trees in 1996? They, they, they haven't planted they have. them yet. That came shortly after yes. this. That's true. Uh, hopefully, they'll get to testing the trees because we know how important that is. Uh, so, all right. Round three, Norman kind of starts to show some signs of like, he's kind of hitting it all over the place. Like, cannot really find the fairway, uh, just kind of missing all. But his short game that sort of Saturday was unbelievable. He scrapes it together shoots a 71, puts him at 13 under. Looks like, you know, he's going to sort of be paired with Phil Mickelson. But Nick Faldo birdies the 18th yeah. hole that day, sneaks into the final pairing. Uh, and, you know, it's starting to wonder, like, everybody's still thinking Greg's got this, no big deal. Uh, but Faldo gives a really good sort of ominous quote, which I will find in just a second, where he essentially says, uh, uh, I'm having trouble finding it, but he says, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, he's, you know, I could, someone could go out and I could go out and shoot 67. It's a lot of pressure. Oh, here it is. If I put some heat on him, who knows what will happen? The 65 on Sunday. Hey, who knows? This is a pressure filled golf course. It is far from over. Uh, the press at the time doesn't really, uh, take this heed. They think, man, like, this is over. Like we're good. Apparently all the Australian writers were like writing their Norman wins stories, uh, in fact, I pulled a fun uh, sort of headline from, I think the, uh, I think it was the Atlanta Journal Constitution, although it's the, they were using a story from the Charlotte Observer. It says, today's round is just a formality. Norman's got it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, 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 the lead of the story by Ron Green, great golf writer. This is not a shot at Ron. Probably would have written the same thing. In fact, did write the same thing about Justin Thomas once. Uh, Greg Norman won the Masters on Saturday. Uh, and then this back up the second line was now if he can only keep from losing it. Uh, don't worry, he won't lose it. Not this time. Surely not this time. I think that's kind of like I think that's kind of tongue in cheek a little bit of he's won it and he could lose it, but like surely it won't happen yep. this time. I, I don't read that as a yep. as a historically bad call there. That's kind of like a I mean, come on, he has to win it this time, right? Right? I don't know. All right, come maybe. on. Uh, uh, Who was the writer that know. that hit um hit maybe you're about to get to this that hit Norman with the uh the quote in the club. I don't want to ruin it if you've got it. Yeah. So as Norman is leaving the course Saturday night, uh, he does a press, his press thing. He's walking through the bar 
at Augusta. And there's a British writer who he's known for many years, Peter Debringer, I believe yeah. his name. Uh, he says, uh, well, Greg, oh boy, not even you can fuck this <laughs> up. <laughs> and Norman says at this point, like years later, he says, now, why did he say that? Like, why did, you know, why did you have to sort of put that thought in my mind and starts to actually like, let it perhaps like affect him a little bit. Uh, I mean, look, there's a reason that Greg Norman didn't win like 10 majors. Yeah. And these are sort of, you know, those kind of things. In fact, another sort of person, Norman was sitting in the locker room uh, Saturday night. He was the last guy in there. One of his friends came by and said, oh, you're last night in here, right? And Norman sort of chuckled and said, oh, I hope so. And the locker room attendant thought that everyone had gone and like shut the lights off. And Norman was sitting there all alone in the dark uh, with his thoughts. Oh, I never heard that one. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of things in here that I had not uh, remembered or heard previously that were are very quite interesting. Um, we'll get to them in just like, uh, just for some context, like what this kind of meant culturally, like Dan Patrick sort of famously said on sports center, if, if Norman blows this, it'll be the biggest collapse of golf. It'll be the biggest collapse in modern golf history. So it's like the sort of, even though like everyone kind of thought that Norman was going to get this done, it was sort of hovering in the air. Uh, so our friend, our dear friend, Peter Costas, yes. uh, actually, uh, has an interesting tidbit here is Peter said throughout that week that he was watching Norman on the range and he saw that Norman had been sort of experimenting with a stronger grip, uh, all week, sort of in earlier in the week. And that's part of the reason why he played so great in the, uh, first round is that he was just like taking the sort of, you know, right side out of the course, like everything was, you know, hitting, hitting it straight or hitting a fade or whatever. And slowly over the course of the week, uh, his grip got a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker each day. And he started playing progressively worse. And Costas was like walking, uh, like around Saturday night, sort of the, this, all this kind of stuff's going on. And he sees Brian Hammonds from the golf channel and they're sort of chatting or whatever. And, and Brian sensor says, Oh, it's, you know, this thing's over. Right. And Costa says, well, you know, I don't know. Like, I think actually like, you know, this grip thing could sort of rear its head. Like he didn't play very well today. Could be an issue tomorrow. Who knows? Whatever. So Hammonds <clears throat> goes on the golf channel that <laughs> night and just basically is like, Whoa, Peter I just talked to Peter Costas. Not over. I just talked to Peter Costas, and this could be like a big disaster tomorrow. <laughs> Funnier though is that Norman calls Frank Chicane. They played it on the local Augusta affiliate that uh, wow. next morning. I think that that clip they they played it on local TV in Augusta that okay. morning. And so Norman is watching yes. this on local TV or whatever, and and the day of yes. the Sunday of the Masters with a six shot lead calls up Frank Chicani and the CBS famous CBS producer and just reams into him and basically says like, you know, your guys is this bullshit. Like, how dare you? Blah, blah, blah. So not exactly like a great headspace uh, that Norman is in this morning. This is an interesting tidbit that I had never read. Uh, but as I started of doing research, the Sam Wyman of the golf digest, um, I think he's one of the sort of top editors over there now. Uh, he talked to Norman years later for a book about like, how do people deal with losing adversity and the 96 masters are a big part of it. And Norman admitted to Sam that he was dealing with a personal issue that morning, uh, that was sort of consuming his head and he was, has never admitted what it was. Wyman sort of alluded to, you know, the fact that he'd been married three times, it's hard to know, like if I, I was unclear if that was sort of an illusion, like maybe Dean and his wife had some sort of argument or whatever. But Norman talked about this later uh, and, and Butch Harmon was like, what the fuck is wrong with you on the range? He was just like all out of sorts. Uh, and Harmon said years later to, to Wyman, I've always said one night he and I were going to get drunk somewhere and I was going to say, okay, what the fuck happened on Sunday? He's never told anybody. He's never told Tommy Navarro, his caddy, what it was. Uh, we knew something was wrong. We were both standing by or saying, standing there by saying, who is this guy? This is not the guy that we left last night. Uh, and Norman said, he told Wyman this, the day could have been salvaged if he'd been honest with Harmon and Navarro about what was really going on, but he never did. And by the time he missed his first fairway en route to an opening bogey, there was no turning back. I should have told them both and just purged, Norman said. It would have taken like 10 minutes and would have been over with, but I didn't do it. So the lesson here is don't harbor things internally. Don't push the elephant under the rug. Anxiety and happiness both come from within. 
So you have to ask, which one do you prefer? Wow. Which, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, 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 the only thing to... I can remember or think of, and this might be totally separate from what he's talking about, was there was some something happened between Saturday and Sunday of someone or friends or whatnot coming in town, like taking his his plane got sent back home to bring people up to celebrate on Sunday or something like that against his mm -hmm. will. Um, I, I, his his wife at the time, I guess, had had organized that something along those lines is the only thing I'm mm -hmm. thinking of. But I I'm, that doesn't sound right if it's if it's really still a secret to this day. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I, I just you know who knows. I mean, obviously, like Norman's had a lot of you know drama in his personal life, uh, and uh, it's hard to you know, speculate like too much, uh, about what it was, but I, I honestly, like, I know we've, Nor we've kind of made our jokes about Norman and he has treated people, you know, poorly, I think in a lot of things in life, but you just like, you, you read this kind of stuff and you can't help but feel a little bit, you know, sympathy for him because I mean, he honestly, he handles what happens with such a remarkable amount of yeah. class. Like he he doesn't complain or bitch or make excuses or whatever. And he just, even though he had like a super contentious relationship with the press all those years, like he faces the music and kind of laughs it off. And it's like, hey, it's not a funeral, guys. Like I didn't, you know, and he's for years has been willing to talk about it and basically admit like, yeah, I just, you know, I didn't have it that day. And he did the whole documentary with the uh, same guy who did the um, the Bulls documentary, Jason. Jason I Hayer, last yeah. This one, but yeah, and so J and they sit down and like rewatch the whole like you know awesome. eighteen holes of what happened. It's really great, and in fact, like you know, Rory watched that and felt so much sympathy for Greg that he texted him. It was one of the first times that like they had like a personal interaction. It was like, hey man, like I really you know felt for you during all that. So I think it's the, probably the last time they had any kind of warm. Well, uh, sort Norman of shortly said for he was brainwashed right after that. <laughs> 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 I was like, fuck this guy, man. <laughs> um, I, I mean, this was, so, this was like the, I think this is the fourth podcast we've covered this tournament in some way. Like I, I, I still yes. can't get enough of it. It is so, I honestly don't know if I, and I probably would have been here, but <clears throat> cause Tiger had a huge effect on me, but like, this was yeah. one of my first golf memories. This was, I was extremely impressionable at this time. I've said this many times. I was close to 10 years old at this time. And man, it was just like, like the fact that that could happen in golf at to somebody that was balling out for 54 holes and could just melt down in front of the entire country, entire sports world. Mm -hmm. It like was so appealing to me. It was so uh, just ingrained in, uh, again, I say this every time we do a nineties pod is like, I, Chokes happened way more often back then. With that equipment, it yep. was way, way harder to get it in the house uh, than it is currently. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you even possibly debate that at this point. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, it's I every time I think, I feel like it clouds. Maybe I don't know, clouds is the right word, but like uh, seasons, like every feeling that we have when someone has a big lead, it's like, oh well, this could totally yeah. happen. You know, this is. I mean, I. I don't know the masters. It, I feel like it just used to sort of maybe torment some people a little bit more than it did. I don't know what, uh, maybe that's equipment. Yeah. So who knows? Uh, um, anyway, like there's some, uh, some really good writing on this era. Like obviously Rick Riley has been our sort of, uh, dude, uh, in a lot of ways for looking back at all these majors. Uh, I just want to read, like, this is sort of a, a famous story that he wrote about Norman's collapse. And it begins, on the drive to the golf course, she saw a graveyard and secretly held her breath, closed her eyes and made a wish. When your dad is Greg Norman, you stop trusting Sundays and you start working all the angles you can, six shot lead or no. But by the end of the day, Morgan Lee Norman, 13, was just another mourner in a green carpeted funeral procession, a red eyed witness to the blackest golfing day of her father's life. The day he somehow spent all six of those shots and five more besides, stilled 50,000 people and turned a glorious spring afternoon at the Masters into a four and a half hour cringe. Uh, pretty good, like, scene center yeah. right there. It was, uh, you know, uh, Riley was a dude. So, I don't know like how worth it is like going step by step through um some of you know what happened essentially like norman feels like the lead that he didn't really feel like he was in trouble until the ninth hole when he hit a shot that came up probably six feet short and spun all the way back down and cut the lead to two and he was like oh crap like i'm in trouble now so that was sort of like there's a, a great moment in that documentary too where again he's he's watching it back on the ipad and and i think jason asks him like hey 
It was when was there a time where you knew like like something was up and he points at the iPad? He's like that right there. Like that was it right there. And I was like, fuck, man, that was mm-hmm. that was powerful storytelling of uh to relive it that way. And I'll, and that's again, that's kudos to Greg in a recent kudos to Greg of like being willing to put. Yeah. I mean, great. He's one of the most vain persons ever to walk the face of the earth. Like even in defeat, he's willing to get in front of a camera and uh, and, and and talk about it again. But it was interesting perspective. It's, it's, I kind of always wondered, like, what is it that drives that about him? Like, why was he willing to sort of relive that failure over and over again? Uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that I would do it. I don't know any other golfer. I mean, like, it's not like Rory has ever gone in and, you know, literally one of the most friendly media people ever and like relived shot by shot what yeah. happened in, you know, 2011. That's right. Point. So, I mean, you know, if he wants to do it, I'm happy no, to sit. Norman sit won, Rory like, zero. <laughs> Norman wins the fight. <laughs> uh, so things start to get a little more tense. And, you know, it makes a bogey on nine, uh, makes a bogey on 10 after sort of a, uh, you know, a bad second shot uh, and, a, and a sort of shitty chip. Uh, makes another bogey on 11. Uh, at this point, he and Faldo are tied uh, going into the 12th. Uh, and this is where Riley kind of has another sort of I think for the, it's, it's a very, when you talk about like the writing of the times of like what it is. So it says, now there was an uneasiness among the dogwoods, a sickening feeling as Norman came to the one hole. You do not want to come after blowing a six shot lead. It is the 12th, the Drew Barrymore of par threes, small, gorgeous, and sheer trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's a perfect 1996 quote. Like that's perfect. So good. Drew yeah. Barrymore was probably so, like I don't know up there in celebrity rankings at that point. What a what a, yes. what a time capsule that quote is. Yep. Uh, so on Saturday, uh, Norman actually had hit, left a ball like that sort of sailed wide on twelve, but it actually kind of got the couple's cling. It just held up on the bank, and everyone's like, "Oh, maybe that's the break that Norman needed to uh, to win the Masters." Well, he does the same thing like on twelve on Sunday shot tumbles down into the water it's like you know you only get one one cling your entire life and he already sort of used uh, his up uh david ledbetter actually sort of was quoted here in the story he says he, greg's routine was so different he's standing over the ball for an incredible so amount of time i say if he's spending six seven seconds longer per shot fidgeting moving around in ways i've never seen him do uh is you know is this where it's like the humanity of it. his his daughter was like praying to trying to calm uh, Norman's wife. It's going to be all right, mom. Uh, and, and this is right before it's in it, Riley said, it might be on right in time, but the shot definitely wasn't. <laughs> he pushed it right to Faldo's ball, which sat happily on the green. And then watched it slide back into the pond. Sorry. Only one couple's cling per masters, double bogey, fifth straight five. And the first time all week, he did not lead. Unfathomably Faldo led by two shots in five holes. Norman had handed Faldo six shots. Jesus. Uh, so he actually makes a birdie on 13. Can I, uh, can I but pause he just one in, second to yeah, say we were do. recording this the week after the U.S. Women's Open, uh, and I, I think I said on the on the pod last Sunday, I said, Allison Corpus, if you're a coach of any kind, like well, get a replay of that of that final round, watch the demeanor, mm-hmm. watch the routine on repeat, and like learn from that. Like that's how you handle major championship pressure on a Sunday. Do you want the yeah. opposite of how to do all that? Watch the 1996 Masters on YouTube because it it stands out. I don't. I have never timed Norman's routine. I don't know the time, and I can tell you, like just from watching it, he stands over the ball way too long, way too many regrips. Yeah. It is hor- It's horrible to watch in that in that regard. And yeah. all of the mindset stuff you're talking about leading up to this, everything is just the total opposite way you would go about it. Yeah. Uh, so on 13, he actually he hits it up in the pine straw, and he wants to go for it. And Navarro was like, yeah, man, like, we can't do this. Like, let's please lay up. Let <laughs> Riley him wrote, cook. Nav- <laughs> Riley wrote, Nav- uh, Navarro argued that uh, hitting a ball 213 off uh, yards off a of pine needle was too much to ask for a man who'd hit only five greens all day. <laughs> Which was such a sweet dig. Uh, so they both par 14, but we come to 15, which is sort of gives us the most uh, memorable image of the day. Uh, Norman falling to his knees as he tries to chip in. Back to 13 real quick, Uh, just because I've referenced this moment a lot of times, but uh, Faldo takes about three minutes to hit his shot into 18, but uh, it's back and forth between like two iron and four wood, if I remember right. And it was some real suspense, real drama. And uh, he steps up and just hits a laser for uh, two iron to the middle of the green and two putts for birdie. And it was just a really memorable shot of those those times. Uh, And I always reference to people to go watch that moment on YouTube. 
Well, it's a great it's a great window into like the caddy conversation, right? He and Fanny are sort of debating forever, going back and forth. He goes back to the bag, what like three times, or whatever. Like, I suppose maybe like you know it's a little bit slow play situation, but it's worth it. And the CBS did a great job of sort of letting that hang in the air, right? There's nobody trying to talk over this clip. They're just letting the drama of that moment build. Yep. Whole day, the whole day, that whole rewatch is just letting drama seep through in the most natural ways. It's just not. They're not handing it to you. I feel like announcers these days will just kind of force it. They're not letting silence happen. And that I remember, I remember because I've rewatched it, but it is, uh, sure. it's, it's, it's tense. Uh, years later, Norman, he referenced this on like in this moment when he was feeling pressure that he used to stick his thumb into his rib cage so hard that he was in so much pain that he couldn't take it, almost couldn't take it just to try to block out all the other Whoa. stuff. So like, imagine him like walking up 14, 15 fairway, like jamming his thumb into his Norman chest, left like, four before. ribs shorter than when he started this day. <laughs> Uh, so chip, the chip on 15 is what sort of is brings us the most memorable image, uh, really in one of them of all time. It ends up being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I think. Is Norman, he he has a chip on 15 for Eagle. Faldo's probably like sitting like, you know, 10 feet away. Norman feels like if he makes this chip and Faldo doesn't make his birdie, he might still be in it. He might have a chance. Uh, he, his chip like runs up. It, it misses by, you know, an inch or two. And Norman just falls to the ground like he's been shot. Like everything in his body just sort of like goes out of him. He told Graham Bissinger years later that he knew in that moment that it was over, that like he was not going to win. Uh, Faldo makes his birdie anyway, the cold hearted, <laughs> blood, cold, cold blooded motherfucker. And so Norman goes up to 16 T and he said later that like he felt like he was honestly like blacking out, like his body and his arms didn't feel connected at all. And he just didn't even like he usually picked like a spot on the TV tower where he sort of tried to hit like a, you know, a, a, a draw off of. And he was he, all week. He'd sort of hit that spot. And he's like, I don't even remember like that swing. And it ended up like right in the middle of the park. It was like it, it was hit. And you watch him. And he's looking. He's like looking at it. The whole he doesn't show disgust while it's in the air. And you're like, oh, is this? And it it is a horrific shot. <laughs> it does not come close to anything. Like, dude, what were you no. looking at? Like, what were you hoping for no. out of that? And then I remember the image of him like walking, dragging his club along the ground, like trying to clean the club. And that's when it was yeah. like, dude, this is we got to get the fuck out of here, guys. This is dark. I mean, this that was when it was truly like a funeral yeah. procession. Like, it's just like misery. Uh, so. Uh, Afterwards, you know, essentially they, they play it out, but it doesn't matter. Faldo makes a weird birdie on 18 and like hugs Norman and basically is like, you know, I don't know what to say. Like, I feel, you know, sort of terrible. Uh, and, and, but I, I feel so bad for you. Like in the, in the moment where like Nick yeah. Faldo won his, uh, <laughs> his third green jacket, he's like feeling more sympathy for, uh, for Greg. And even like in the, um, you know, Crenshaw had to put the, jacket on uh faldo because he had won the previous year and he says like our since before he started like he talks i don't know i don't remember guys who won the previous year talks but he talked on the microphone according to this rally story and and crenshaw said our sincerest feelings go out to greg uh before he did it and faldo in his victory speech said i really do feel sorry for greg so like norman was the story yeah. like what yeah. you know there was no like that's a good uh lesson in like sometimes the losers are way more compelling than the winners uh, so Norman meets the press and, you know, this is a person who's had a contentious relationship with the press and he just basically goes right in. He says, I screwed up. It's all on me. I know that, uh, but losing this masters is not the end of the world. I'll let this one get away. And I'm still, but i still have a pretty good life. I'll wake up tomorrow, still breathing. I hope. Uh, and then he pauses and he says, all these hiccups I have, they must be there for a reason. All of this is just a test. I just don't know what the test is. Uh, so thousands and thousands of people wrote him uh, fan mail uh, years uh, for years to come about how appreciative they were of how he sort of dealt with it. Norman said he was at a soccer game the next day and someone came up to him and said, I want to tell you, you taught me the greatest lesson in life. And now I can teach to my son how to handle uh, defeat, how to handle disappointment and, I sh and how I should conduct myself going forward. Uh, so I told him you did win, you won in life. And Norman sort of felt like that was almost more important in some ways than, uh, you know, he said, I could have, I could have not gone into that press conference and walked away and said, Hey, I'm going to go home and cry. He said, no, that's the responsibility you have. If you want to be in the arena, if you're going to go out there and accept the accolades, 
You've got to accept the punch in the stomach just as much. You've got to be man enough to do it. And if you don't, shame on you. I can name quite a few professional golfers today who have run away from that responsibility, which really pisses me off because their responsibility is to the game and to that tournament. Because when you pass through and you want people to say he or she really did a good job of playing golf, but really they did a good job of instilling certain values for us to study. I don't know if I would say that Greg has like great <laughs> values, but I think that that it comes to sportsmanship. What a I, what a top as of low ninety six. That's yes. Great. I was trying to. I just quickly googled. I was, I was like, wait, doesn't he go home that night and and cry on the beach? But I just googled it quickly. That Sam Wyman article. I think you're referring to. He did, that was eighty seven after the chip it so mm -hmm. a different master's heart he says hurt him a yeah. lot more he says because he thought like that was his in that moment like i've i've got it in control there's no way what the, that uh, larry mize is going to be able to get this up and down like all i essentially have to do is two putt this and i won the masters then all of a sudden he chips it in it's like holy yeah. shit uh Jim Nance actually had a great interview with Norman like a couple weeks later uh, on his boat. Uh, it's funny. I wanted, I would love to, I took a screenshot of the pictures. I think I'm going to tweet them out because they're both like so young looking and so like it's, it's remarkable, like time capsule. Uh, and so Nance says to him, do you believe you're destined to be a tragic figure or do you believe that you're destined to one day win it? Norman says, I think there's things that are written in the wind, you know, in people's life. I see it happen to people and I can see it happen to me sometimes, the good and the bad that happens. Maybe it's destiny. I don't know. Now, there are some things that where there's a reason why it happens. I will win it. I just know it. When my game is on and it was there, I just it just didn't happen. But I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kick some serious butt in that tournament and I'm going to put a green jacket on. Uh, All right. There didn't it happen. did not happen. Yeah. Uh, but he did say, uh, you know, he and Faldo have had sort of a contentious relationship for many years said that a lot of uh, that hug on the green sort of resonated with a lot of people. So people have this idea that Nick and I have been unfriendly since 1977, which has never been the case. Like what happened Sunday, Saturday, we played, we had a great day. We had a great day Sunday. We chatted in the initial part of the round. It showed people that we aren't unfriendly rivals. We're friends. We do have emotions. For him to do and to say the things that he did when we were in that hug, those are the things that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, it would have been great to put the green jacket on. But if I had put that green jacket on, what would that moment have been? As, would, would that moment have been succinct as it was? Who knows? The most endearing thing for me was the emotion that I felt from everybody. People care and I care. And then he said, and I want to get out there and win the MCI Heritage Classic this week. <laughs> now watch this drive. <laughs> so that's about all I have from uh, the Masters that year. I mean, just uh, well, there's there's really quick, some good writing in general. If you had some stuff to add, well, quick know. add there was just you know I was looking at did his, does he have any more Masters close calls? I don't remember this, and we'll get to it eventually. But 1999, it sounds like he has a mm -hmm. uh, he eagles the 13th hole to get to minus seven, which looks like I, I don't have the time not the timeline in front of me, but that was probably tied for the lead. Bogey's 14 and 15 after that and finished mm. uh, three shots back of Jose Maria. But if he plays those, I mean, if he birdies the par five 15th and doesn't bogey 14, uh, he finishes at eight under and is in a playoff with Jose Maria. So um, another choke. Painful, painful. That back nine just fucking haunted him. I, might, I mean, I might, just I might watch it again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's, I mean, that ESPN documentary that they did is worth watching. He actually goes like... Augusta let him come uh, and play. Uh, you know, I think it's only nine holes there, but like play a little bit more. So it's like to use for the walk and talk stuff about, you know, and he and he sort of says, you know, it shows that I had a, I made an impact if, you know, if Augusta, even though I'm not a champion, Augusta will let me come back here and play a little bit more just to sort of sort of talk about yep. this stuff. So, I agree with that. He said, uh, I think he, he said something like I had an impact on the history of the club. I'm like, oh my God, did you yep. ever? Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did, sir. Um, well, I mentioned this earlier and okay. i don't know if it even it's so unmemorable that I, I'm, I'm if i'd asked you where is the 1996 us open do you remember where it was god i have <laughs> no recollection is it a i mean i would guess like oakland correct hills, we are going to wow oakland hills the, wow what a the north or the south course which one? Oh god uh no idea. South, South course. You were exactly right. Look at this. I'm going to buy a lottery ticket what tonight. What city in Michigan can you get there? It's outside Detroit. Uh, something blow oh, close. No. But, um, All people, the Michigan bluff. people are screaming so loud in their cars right yeah, now. I know. Bloomfield I know. Hills, Michigan. So okay. the okay. purse of the 96 U.S. Open is $2.4 million. The winner gets 425 k in today's money. 
That is four point six seven million and eight twenty six to the winner. Uh, for reference, Cam Smith finished fourth at the U.S. Open this year and made more uh, inflation adjusted uh, than the winner mm -hmm. would have gotten for the nineteen ninety six U.S. <laughs> Open. Thank you, uh, Mr. Woods. Um, our eventual winner. Do you remember who wins? Do I like? I, I'm trying to figure out if I want to tell the story of. Do I want to not spoil who yeah. wins? I'm gonna. I I think not. Don't spoil it just okay. because he's not exactly. I I know because the he the person who lost is involved in a later. Uh, okay. In one of my okay. Majors. So I I'll skip past that to say this is the eighth time Oakland Hills has hosted the U.S. Open. The first since 1985. It also hosted the PGA in 72 and in 79, and would also go on to host the PGA uh, in 2008. Courses measured 6,974 yards, par 70. Uh, it actually measured shorter than it did during the 1937 U.S. Open. Uh, it was a what? par 72 at the 37 U.S. Open, but uh, it was only 50 yards longer than the 51 U.S. Open, which was also played to a, a par 70. So uh, 45 years in between, and of course, it had only been lengthened 50 yards at the same par. Um, so golf equipment was not uh, moving as quickly as, as it is now. Um I think we would have had some takes about this golf course back in the day. Uh, mm. Donald Ross golf course redone by, can you guess? Don't say the Foz. Uh, the the open doctor. Robert it, yeah, Trent so. Jones uh, redid it. I uh, want to give another shout out for sponsoring hour long segments of United States open content with no commercials. Rolex in 1996 uh, has another wow. U.S. open film that is on YouTube. We thank the USGA for uploading all this stuff to YouTube. <laughs> There's a there's a reason why they were on the top of the live call list after uh, you know the merger thing was announced. They've been they've been OGs all along. Rolex needs to know. Uh, the uh, host of the video is of course Johnny Miller, and uh, I'll give you. Uh, can you guess what he references within the first minute of his intro of this video? Oh, I'm gonna say his own sixty final round sixty three uh, at Oakmont, Oakmont to win the U.S. Open. Uh, it's a great video. You should see how young Dan Dan Hicks looks, which you can forget pretty quickly how how long Dan Hicks has been doing this. But uh, Nick Faldo and Greg Norman coming off the 1996 uh, Masters, of course, are the favorites. They're followed by Ernie Pavin, Monty Davis, Love, and Phil Mickelson. Uh, the winner of the '96 U.S. Open was listed as part of the field. Uh, was not listed uh, at, at, you know, again, this one site that sports odds history, I think I used to look these up, mm -hmm. but was not listed uh, in, in, in the odds. So this sure. was the same day as game six of the NBA finals, which the Bulls would win. Um, also, Brady Anderson hit two home runs on his way to a jaw dropping 50 on the season, more than double wow. of any other season in his career. Uh, I have no idea how that happened. Not, not even remotely suspicious <laughs> at all. No. Must have been. I figured as a Baltim Baltimorean uh, that you would, Baltimorean, uh, that you would yeah. appreciate mm -hmm. that. So the course gets absolutely soaked by rain on Wednesday, washing out a bunker. I mean, I'm talking like get the hoses and pumps out. Absolute hmm. deluge on Wednesday. It was like a borderline miracle. They could get the course ready by Thursday. But they were there. They were playing a lot of Dockers, a lot of cotton shirts, <laughs> absolutely zero swag there's not one ounce of swag to be had by anyone even norman doesn't look sharp on this us open i mean norman you know had some tough looking shirts the the, the hats that he wore were fresh and he had the he was the kit yeah. man of the 90s and even this week he just did not bring this stuff um the uh one of the guys i don't want to spoil the winner yet but he's wearing a king cobra hat with the uh he has a titanium element like the 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 periodic table of elements the titanium logo on the back of the hat what? like ti in the little box which is a sick activation what? on the cobra hat like, it is a sick activation i mean the, the titanium thing was still relatively new so let's let's bring back periodic tables <laughs> Un maybe so when we talk about siwoo kim being an unstable <laughs> element that could be a huge Min -Woo Lee is the thing unstable yeah. Min -Woo Lee, excuse me. <laughs> unstable compound excuse me. um how many media members do you think were credentialed at the 96 us open Oh gosh, um, number a hundred, sixteen hundred. That's sixteen that hundred. Really high to me. It really did. Yeah. <laughs> what on earth? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if I just came from the women's U.S. Open, and I bet there were fifty-three people <laughs> there in the in the press room. I mean, I suppose that doesn't include like the people who work the cameras and all that stuff. Yeah, fifth. That is yeah. Insane. They might have been. Uh, pumping these numbers a little bit. But anyways, Woody Austin and Payne Stewart jump out to the first round lead at minus three. Uh, Lee Jansen and uh, a Michigan native John Morse are sitting at two under par. 
then there is a Ooh. slew of guys, including Paul Azinger, David Baganio Jr., who I believe is still playing off. Uh, he's the dude that uh, has the major medical that he makes one start a year and just keeps extending his major medical and getting paid by the PGA <laughs> Tour. Uh, Stu Sink, Bob Ford, uh, the head pro at Oakmont, um, Frank mm. Nabilo, Jumbo Ozaki, Philip Walton, and Gary Trevisano are round out the crew at minus one. Uh, Tiger Woods a, uh, got it to two under par at one point, but doubled the 15th and made quad on 16 after going in the water twice. He hit a, uh, a mid iron into the water right and then spun, spun a wedge back into the water from the drop area. It was not controlling a spin in this era. Just just made a couple mistakes. Just didn't have you to. You know, but that's the beautiful thing is I get to go out and play golf again tomorrow. That's, that's, that's what he actually says in the, in the film. Actually, <laughs> that's great. Got a. I, I got an architecture paper that's due the next month, and uh, I just got to get home and work on it. Uh, Greg Norman absolutely undresses a cameraman who who got him twice in his backswing, and uh, it sounds pretty justified, but uh, gets mad at him and then tells him, and don't you go shaking your head at me, yelling at him as he uh, <laughs> is mad after a par three shot. Um, after round two, Payne Stewart leads alone at two under par. Woody Austin, Ernie Els, and a fellow by the name of Greg Norman are one shot back at one under. Norman shot 66 on Friday to tie for low round of the day. Uh, also shooting 66 was Steve Jones after opening with a 74. He is T5 with Steve Jones, 10, Ooh. 10 green. <laughs> Davis Love the third. Frank Nobolo or no, uh, Frank Nobilo. Or what is it? Dan Hicks says it wrong in the video. Nobolo. It's it's Nobolo, <laughs> but he says uh, Nobolo. Yeah. That's what he says. He keeps calling him Frank Nobolo the whole. Uh, so I don't know if this is Frank's first uh, entrance onto the scene, but uh, Sam Torrance is also sitting T5. Uh, the other names in the top 10, Billy Andre, John Cook, John Daly, Jim Furyk, Tom Watson, and Neil Lancaster. Uh, Lancaster, uh, Lancaster or Lancaster? Oh. I don't know. I know the country club is Lancaster and they get mad when you say Lancaster, but... Uh, Lancaster shot a 29 on Friday on his second what? nine, tying the U.S. Rec Open record. Can you tell me who he tied? Uh, the U.S. Open record. Would that be Jack Nicklaus? I will give you a hint. Uh, we covered this on our 1994 U.S. Open podcast. Oh, uh, is this... Uh... Oh, yeah, it's uh, Brad Faxon, right? Uh, Neil Lancaster I, shot a 29 on Friday, tying the U.S. Open record. Who did he tie? He tied Neil Lancaster. The same what? Guy <laughs> shot a 29 what? at Shinnecock Hills the year before in the final round. Yes, Neil. So Neil Lancaster's, like, best ball U.S. Open is a 58? <laughs> Probably even better than that. But, yes, he shot a 29 at both U.S. Opens back-to-back -back years, both times, tied his own record. Wow. Um that was from the U.S. Open at, uh, uh, sorry, at Riviera, Shinnecock, right? the one we just that? did. Shinnecock. Yes. Oh, and we went okay, over okay, this okay. on there. I don't blame you for not remembering because I double-checked. I'm like, wait a second, didn't he just do this? And it is a fact that yeah. he did. Didn't, okay, so the PGA was at Riviera. Didn't Faxon shoot some He went out in at, 28 uh, yeah. on the front nine on Sunday. Okay, yeah, you're, 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 not, about. you're not far off there. So I'm not far. I'm not that no. wrong. I mean, I'm wrong, but I'm not that wrong. Uh, <laughs> can you guess how many players made the cut? Uh, seven. 108 players made the cut. This is back during the what? 10 shot rule, of course. 10 shot so rule. 108 wow. players played the weekend. Uh, one of them includes Mr. Jack Nicholas, which we'll get to that uh, as well. So, 108 players playing the weekend. Round three. Can you imagine how hard it is to get like 108 guys around on the weekend at a US oh, Open? Oh, my God. I don't know what they did if they went both tees or or what they did, but um, I think they're in twosomes. So Tom Lehman takes the 54-hole lead at two under par after a sizzling 65 on Saturday. Steve Jones is one behind at minus one. They'll be in the final pairing. Two shots back are Davis Love, John Morse hanging around, Frank Nobolo. Uh, the rest of the top Nobolo. 10 is Woody Austin, Ernie Els, Jim Furyk, Monty, and Sam Torrance. So kind of a hitter's only thing up here aside from a couple, uh, aside from Steve Jones and John Morse. Norman, unfortunately, faded to a 74 on Saturday. And KVV, he missed a putt that I am like struggling to describe to you. So I know people listening, uh, this is not going to really help you, but I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to upload a photo of uh, Norman's putt that he missed on the 17th green because it will shock you. I have never seen a professional miss a putt that has hit with two hands, like stood over it in a normal stance. 
Like here, here's the the distance oh, wow. of putt that he missed on the 17th hole on Saturday while in contention at the U.S. Open. I mean, it's you tell me, is that over a foot? Uh, it's not over a foot. It's it's got to be 10 inches, maybe. It's uh, I yeah. mean, it Oof. was a tough scene. It misses low on the left side, and uh, it 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 may come back to haunt him a little bit. But that was really really tough. But. <laughs> Uh, Payne Stewart uh, wilted after having the 36-hole lead. He said afterward that he felt like he was naked out there. Uh, he shot a 76 to fall uh, well out of uh, contention uh, at that point. It was a tough scene. He was double-crossing it everywhere. It was not good. So heading into round four, Greg Norman makes a charge. Some early birdies gets back to even par uh, through seven, but he did falter from there. Uh, Layman bogeys the, bogeys the opening hole to drop back into a tie for the lead with Steve Jones. Uh, Nabilo birdies the first and is also at one under par. Layman birdies the second. Birdies six and seven to open up a three-shot lead with ten holes to go in the U.S. Open. Three holes later, that lead is gone. Uh, Steve Jones birdies the ninth hole and makes a 40-footer on the 10th as Lehman bogeys it. Uh, it's also worth noting, Lehman led the U.S. Open at Shinnecock just a year ago with nine holes to go also. So a mm. uh, bit of a developing story. Steve Jones birdies the par 5 12th and Lehman bogeys it. Kind of got a raw deal, hit a great, looks like a three-wood into the green that goes into the back bunker in a tough spot uh, and is and he hits onto the green and then three putts from there. Um so Steve Jones actually has a two-shot lead with six holes to go at four under, but he bogeys the 13th hole. Uh, another name emerges on this back nine after birdies on the 11th and 12th holes. Uh, that is Davis Love, and he pours in a birdie on the 15th to get to minus three, a key number. Keep that one in mind. Um, so Jones and Love are tied at the top at three under par, and Lehman is one back as they are uh, as as Lehman and Jones are getting to 15. Uh, John Morris is still around. He birdies 15 to get to two under par, but made two bogeys coming in. Um, Michigan's own John Michigan's Morris. own. They were trying to will him over the home edge. game model. First cut he's ever made in a major. And he actually has a putt on 18 to tie the lead uh, wow. on the 72nd green. He actually ends up three putting. It. It's not great. Uh, but Johnny's just having a field day with the pressure line. I mean, it's 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 everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. <laughs> um, so they get to, to 16. Tom Lehman hit a really, really, really good birdie putt on 16 that lipped out on the high side. It really looked like he made it. Um, that was a, a, a big moment. Did, par 317th was playing difficult all day long, and Davis Love gets up. He was three under par, but bogeys the 17th hole. Um, and he, uh, it, it, um, so at this, and then he gets up to 18 and hits it to about 30 feet on 18 and has a putt to get in the house at minus three. And they're really building the drama up on this putt. Like Davis Love has made a great run at this. And uh, Johnny says before he hits it, he's like, I got a feeling this might be going in. Uh, narrator, Ooh. it did not go in. Uh, he left oh. it short. He left. Well, good for Johnny for not doing the tape delayed shots. Exactly. You know, that, I mean, I was, maybe that wasn't acceptable back then. They didn't use, you know, tape delayed shots. But I, I think now, like, you know, the thing I've always heard about that famous uh, Louis Oosthuizen shot is that when uh, David Faraday says, oh, come to Papa, that it was on delay that he knew that oh, it was going man. in already. So that's what said that line. Sorry to ruin it for you. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've heard. Uh, so the good for Johnny for calling it live like a man. So, yeah, he lags it up there to two feet, of course, on 18. Uh, surely that means that he, uh, you know, taps in that par putt and uh, will sit and wait yeah, for the surely. leaders to come in. And again, I'm going to pull this up on the screen so you can see it. <laughs> this is Davis Love's putt on the 72nd green at Oakland Hills. And... He gets over it Yikes. and it's nervy, stands over it and then backs off uh, and waves a bug away from the ball, stand, gets back over it and mm. uh, misses the putt on the low side. Missed a three putted from 30 feet um, to fall all the way back to minus one. As this is happening, Steve Jones bogeys the 17th hole. Um, so the, so really he's one shot out of it. And Layman or Jones are tied playing the last hole, playing together. So the winner, one of them makes par or both, you know, that's going to limit it's a bit of a match play situation close to yeah. a match play situation here, but layman steps up His caddy wanted him to take three wood off the 18th, but layman went with driver and he striped it. He drove it really well, but a bit left and the fairway can't a little right to left. It takes a tough kick and gets into the top right corner of the fairway bunker. Like pretty oh. tough break. Honestly, um, it mm. didn't look like a wayward tee shot. He was anxious the whole time, but Maybe a poor decision to take a club that could reach that bunker, but it was it was really tough. 
Jones splits the fairway. Uh, Layman gets up there, looks at the lie, surveys it, and, like gets bends down to the ground, looks at it, says it's a big lip. Gets in there and has seven iron, and he's what he's waggling, and he just like backs off. He's like, I can't get this there. Like I, yeah, I, this won't even get there. So he's not going to take a club mm -hmm. that could hit the lip that he also can't reach the green with. Goes back yeah. for a different club, blasts it out, and lays up about sixty yards short of the green. Steve Jones steps up, 168 yards. Uh, but worth noting, the, the sportsmanship note, at some point, I don't know if this was on 18 or if this was earlier in the round, but Steve Jones referred to this afterwards. He said uh, that Layman came up to him at one point and said, I've got a Bible verse for you. Uh, be courageous and be strong was included in that Bible verse. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, it, 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 I don't, it seemed like these guys are pretty good buddies, but there is a uh, mm -hmm. a... a a, a channeling of the Lord's spirit between the two of them in the, uh, in the final, oh. this final round. Um, I'm appreciative. Of the Lord could take some time to decide the U S open winner. It's, you know? it's, we're not going busy, there. We're not a, going there. We'll save that. Busy for another deity, pod. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it does speak to me a little bit. Like the class that layman shows throughout all of this is pretty remarkable to me. And we'll get to some of that yeah, as well. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jones steps up and they, they, he gets over. He's like, it's one Roger Malpe says 159 front 168 flag. It's seven iron and hit it hard. It was, it was a great call. <laughs> and Jones lashes at it, draws it in. Uh, it, it's in the air. And Johnny's like, where is this one, Roger? And that's going on the right side of the green. It's drawn in. It looks pretty good. Takes one hop and almost jars in the hole. I mean, it missed oh. by two inches. <laughs> Rolls 12 feet above the hole. And uh, and I, I guess they're walking up to 18 green and he asks uh, Steve Jones asks his brother and his caddy, how's it stand? And uh, he says, Layman and Love are tied with you at, at plus two or at minus two. And that was wrong. Um, so hmm. I, I don't remember when the I guess he, he does. His brother, Scott, corrects him before they get up there and says, Love is actually at one. Um, and while Layman's struggling to make part. So Layman pitches up from 60 yards, but goes past Jones's mark, has a 15, 18 footer down the hill to save par mm -hmm. does not make it jones has the 12 footer it's a fast putt and he like kind of tries to like walk it in and will it in and it misses low it goes 18 inches by like a little mm -hmm. far by um well, luckily no one's missed a short yeah. putt all day he's so, on a different know. side of the hole than love was on like love's putt did not actually look very simple but jones's putt should be uh he said that was the longest foot of his life nbc like misses the contact he makes with the putt because they cut away to look at his wife but he, what? But he like he does a couple practice strokes and hits it so quickly when he gets over it that they basically miss impact, and it goes right in the heart. <laughs> it's no big deal. His kids come out on the green. Steve Jones has won the 1996 U.S. Open. His kids run out on the green. He picks them up. His daughter's waving at the people. I got pregnancy hormones going on over here. It hit me in the feels mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah, I was I was feeling that <laughs> ball but a little bit. Uh, Layman pretty quickly in an interview says, he, you know, afterward, he's like, I, I couldn't have picked a better guy to win. Uh, Steve Jones is a great guy. And, um, zooming back to what I was going to set up with Steve Jones, but didn't want to spoil the ending. Uh, Jones, a four time PGA tour winner as of 1989, but suffered a dirt bike accident in 1991 that threatened to end his career. He separated his shoulder, sprained an ankle, as well as he suffered from ligament damage in his left ring finger. And because of that, almost mm -hmm. every writer wrote about this. He developed a reverse overlap grip. He had a very funky grip, way of gripping the club, hit these big sling and draws everywhere, kind of a funky swing. Didn't play for three years and didn't make it back on tour until 1994. The 96 mm -hmm. U.S. Open was the first U.S. Open he played since 91, and he had to go through sectional qualifying, including a playoff at sectionals, and was the first winner to do that since Jerry Pate in 1976. Um so wow. that's a lot of the writing afterwards was about um uh, about bikes. all of this but uh <laughs> our friend uh the eugene register guard our, of course our friends there their headline was stellar field humbled by a man named jones which is just oh. I, I, I googled it. a man named jones is that like a a book or is it a movie or something like that it's not it's just a straight up shot at so. steve jones which is such a <laughs> sick way to honor the u.s open champion um rick riley his his post uh game his gamer was a letter to ben hogan um which oh, uh, ben hogan okay. did win at oakland hills um he says i'm writing to you about this about this steve jones a nice guy who uh is about as square as a pan of cornbread uh which is sweet is that what has happened to golf yeah. when the open champ grips the club completely wrong seriously he grips it like marilyn monroe used to grip a microphone which is by putting the index finger of his left hand on top of his right hand which is the opposite of what it says you should do in all the books you ever wrote he calls it his reverse overlap varden jones grip and laughs about it 
He grips it the way this way because he blew out his left hand in a dirt bike accident in 91 and couldn't play golf for almost three years. And the doctors weren't sure he was ever going to play. In fact, he wasn't too sure either. Maybe that's why he kind of gave up a few years ago and started selling some waterless car wash gizmo. Um, he said, okay. that's not all this Jones was battling this layman fellow down the stretch and it's real warp and woof with Jones, mostly one shot ahead of layman and about the 16th hole Jones is just about as nervous as a priest on a Sunday with a Sunday tea time. And guess who talks him off the ledge? <laughs> it's layman. Yes, sir. Layman lays a little Joshua one nine on him. They're walking down the fairway, supposedly trying to beat each other's brains in layman says to Jones, God wants us to be strong and courageous. That's God's law. And Jones looks at him and says, right. Amen. This calms Jones down enough to, that he's able to beat Layman in love by one shot. Now, my next question is, you ever, you never said anything like that to Snead or Demerit or Nelson, did you? I mean, I, I can't see you saying anything at all. Remember when you <laughs> won in 51 and Clayton Hefner, who was second by two shots, shook your hand afterward and said, congratulations, Ben. And you replied, thank you. How'd you do? Uh <laughs> You know what's hilarious to me, Solly, is that Ben Ben Hogan is alive at this point. Yes. <laughs> I just looked it up. And so, like, can you imagine Ben Hogan like getting his sports illustrated? He's pretty yeah. old at this point. He's gonna die within a year. But it's like, what if you're like Ben Hogan, you're like, what the fuck, young man? Like, I why are you writing a letter to me about this nobody? <laughs> uh, <laughs> listen, as a writer, as a writer, sometimes you gotta take risks. Sometimes you gotta do a little bit of quirky stuff. If yeah. you know somebody who you're you're hoping to write a like David Love, Davis Love wins the US Open, and it turns out to be Steve Jones. Sometimes you gotta yeah. get creative. Sometimes, like uh, you know, with Wyndham Clark, you gotta write a scene piece. He also writes that Jones would later credit Hogan's book for helping win the US Open as he realized he wasn't practicing nearly hard enough after reading uh Hogan's book. So he also wrote about um some USGA stuff going on. He said, But if you were here, I'm not sure you would have recognized the place. Speaking of Oakland Hills. The USGA has this funny habit of taking classic Donald Ross courses like this, courses with roller coaster greens that were meant to be putted on at nothing more than, say, five on the stint meter, turning them into 10 and 11, which makes things kind of preposterous. Oakland Hills became home of the 15-foot putt with 20-foot break. To make things even gorier, the USGA took holes, the eight, two holes, the 8th and 18th, that, may, that look like par fives, are built like par fives, and are par fives, and made them par four, so the landing areas made no sense, and guys were hitting three woods into greens that were built to handle wedge shots. I mean, if you're going to admire the Mona Lisa, admire it. Don't redo the eyes and change the shadowing and try a new frame, right? So, yes, that is the Mona Lisa being compared to uh, Oakland Hills, which is <laughs> Oakland a, Hills. a tough stretch. But um, it seems like uh, the media has been complaining about USGA setups for, oh, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years. So. <laughs> This is uh, from Larry Dornan at the uh, New York Times. He said there were just two players left with a chance to, uh, to lead by then. They were both in the same group. Greg Norman's early charge had long since dissipated. John Morse, a Michigan native, bogey the 16th and 18th. Frank Nabolo, the New Zealander whose ancestors were Italian pirates, walked the plank. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> all right. There's a lot going on in that sentence. <laughs> First of all. Frank Nabolo's ancestors were Italian pirates. <laughs> How does one even find out such a thing? <laughs> Frank, please come on the podcast and talk about your piracy and your family. Because <laughs> I want to know all about these pirates. <laughs> Is there pirate lore in your family of the Nabolo's talked about? Like your family's like just sailed around like you know the Mediterranean like robbing people, <laughs> and, and then they went to New Zealand after they like got a bunch of bounty. <laughs> also, walk the plank. Oh, so sick! <laughs> I, my jaw when I read that I was like, oh, that's why we do these pods. This literal line is why we do these podcasts. <laughs> oh. Oh, walk the play. God, I'm, I'm so never good. I'm never going to be able to see Frank Nobel on TV again without thinking about <laughs> this Italian pirate family. <laughs> this Kiwi Italian oh. pirate family. Oh. oh, I don't know how to bring this back around. Uh, <laughs> Steve Jones was the fifth consecutive U.S. Open champion who had never won a major before, uh, including Tom Kite, Lee Jansen, Ernie Els, and Corey Pavin. 
Uh, Steve Jones was this, uh, this, the Colorado Sand Greens champion two years running per Rick Riley as well. Oh, wow. You would go on to win three more times on tour. This was the third close call for Lehman after the 94 Masters to Jose Maria and the prior year's U.S. Open to Corey Pavin. Um, Jack Nicklaus played his 40th consecutive U.S. Open and hinted once again that there won't be a 41st. Uh, he said he would be Aww. back if he wins the U.S. Senior Open, but did uh, he did not do that again. Uh, he would, of course, play four more and play his last U.S. Open at Pebble in 2000. Jack, how can we ever miss you if you just don't leave? So <laughs> I need you to help me with this part. I, I forget which which newspaper I saw this in, but there's a little note section that's in there. And man, I I have no idea the relevance of this or why, but it just starts. It's a it's a it's four little graphs here, very short. It says, okay. Doctor Jack Kavorkian, who has made his reputation by bucking the establishment, thinks golf could benefit with some changes. For example, he'd like to see names on the back of golf shirts similar to baseball. Uh, what? <laughs> There I go again, said Kevorkian, who was a spectator at the U.S. Open on Saturday. I always want to change things, and here I am surrounded by traditionalists. Um, I want to. Uh, it says Kevorkian, who has been present 29 times at suicide at a suicide, said he wanted to meet Jack <laughs> Nicholas, who was playing the 40th and perhaps last Open. Uh, I'm going to walk up to Jack Nicholas and tell him, "If you don't win, I'm here," said Kevorkian, who took up golf <laughs> 10 years ago. What? What? No, no, I no, no. That is like a, I swear to God. That's like a Jay Leno bit. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere. Out of, after like, oh yeah, Lauren Roberts, tough week, whatever. Boom. Jack Kevorkian has entered himself in the 1996. Uh, you know, so if you're not familiar with who this is, uh, for this is reading from his Wikipedia page, he publicly championed a terminal uh, patient's right to die by physician-assisted suicide. Uh, saying dying is not a crime. He said he, he assisted at least 130 patients uh, to that end. He was convicted of murder in 99, was often portrayed in the media by the name of Dr. Death. Dr. Death. What, I like, okay, first, first of all, <laughs> let's say you're a media person and you recognize Jack Kevorkian like hanging out in the grandstands at the US Open, right? So you go up into the grandstands, you're like, Dr. Jack, Dr. Death, <laughs> do you have a few minutes to talk about Do you Jack have Nicholas? any takes? <laughs> Just, <laughs> and like, is, is Kevorkian saying I'm here to euthanize Jack's yes! open career? I, or just euthanize Jack Nicholas? Euthanize Jack Nicholas. <laughs> if he's having trouble, I will help you. Yes. I mean, it's a pretty funny bit by Dr. Jack Kevorkian to like say like, oh, you know, if it's, if it's over, I'm here to, you know, to snuff it out, to get, you know, some... Hydrochloroform and like, you know, hold, or hold your head underwater. <laughs> wow. <Yeah>. 96 US <laughs> Open delivered more than I thought it would. Uh, that is it. That is all I have for 96. I think we'll hopefully be a little quicker than the, uh, I know I will be with the PGA because of course they don't give you anything to work with, but Italian piracy. God, is I don't think I can ever follow up Italian piracy. <laughs> <laughs> Please. God, I want to, please assign me a story about Frank Novello and his family at this point. We're going to loop DJ. We got to get to the bottom of this. The, oh my God. All right. So for the open championship, the 125th playing of the uh, open championship, uh, we go to Litham St. Anne's, uh, which is the first uh, golfing club in England that had ever held a golf tournament uh, way back in the 1800s. Not the first uh, open championship. They wouldn't host that for another 20 some years, but, uh, first place that they ever held a, a, a golf sort of tournament uh, where I think it was like eight guys got together and, uh, you know, old Tom and Morris being one of them. So Litham has a lot of history. He hasn't hosted the Open uh, since Duval won. Uh, so it's been a long time. Uh, but Adam, actually, or, uh, Ernie Els. Adam Ernie Scott, Els. excuse me. Adam Adam Scott Ballard, Ernie Els won. Yeah, 2012. Right. Yep. Scott. It's funny. It's like, like with Norman, we still yeah. think of Adam <laughs> Scott more than we think of Ernie Els winning that one. Uh, but it hasn't hosted since uh, Els won it uh, in 2012, I believe. Uh, so open other reason the Litham is sort of well known as the first pl um, the place that uh, Bobby Jones won the first of his three uh, opens was at Litham. Uh, it's where Seve won two of his opens, uh, 79 and 1988. Uh, Seve also competes in this one and um, misses the cut. Uh, this is kind of what we were talking about, the end of Seve's kind of relevance. And this was sort of another reminder of that because this place where he had won uh, two of the opens uh, – 
he kind of just you know hits it wild all, all over the place, which he did back then, but doesn't quite have the recovery magic that he did uh, back then. So, uh, you know, not I'm not going to de- dig deep in this. I think uh, for the most part, we kind of understand, you know, who is uh, is going to end up winning this if you remember historically. But uh, it's a it's a person we've already talked a little bit about uh, in this. So I'm going to start off and just ask you, Sally. What great golfer is uh, is a shot back after 36 holes in this Open Championship? Jack Nicholas. Jack fucking Nicholas at 58 years old. I feel like just doing these. He'd pods, have been 56, we, I believe. 56. Was, okay, that's right, because he was 58 when he made the run. 98 uh, at Augusta. So we still have another. Yes. Uh, even after this, we still have another. Oh, like major championship where Jack Nicholas, le- Jack Nicholas legitimately yes. contends. I think you could make the case that we still kind of underrate how freaking yes. good Jack was. Like the fact, I mean, who at 58 other than Tom Watson one time was still competing in major 56 was competing in majors. Just it's c- totally like Phil. Of. He shoots 66. <laughs> it will be Phil. <laughs> it's yeah. It will be Phil. He shoots 66 in the second round to get to seven under. Mm-hmm. It's the best round since the 65 that he shot at the 86 Masters. Uh, and he did all of this with a gimpy mm-hmm. back. I uh, wasn't even sure that his back was going to hold up. In fact, saying was like, you know, if it's if it's firm and fast, uh, great. Uh, if it gets a little bit cold out there, I don't think my back can hold up. Uh, and sort of, but it does say, you know, uh, who knows what happened over the weekend. I might play great or I might go out the next days, uh, two days and shoot 150. He shot 150 <laughs> the next two days. Uh, just still completely insane. Uh, and we'll come back to uh, Jack again in a couple, you know, in, t- in due time when we get to uh, the uh, the Masters, which is still, to me, one of the most amazing things ever is that Jack Nicholas legitimately contends in the 1998 Masters year after. and beats Tiger Woods a year yes. after Tiger Woods won. By one of the 12, greatest 12 facts ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So the first round leader of this tournament is Tom Lehman. Uh, Tom Lehman rebounds from his U S open disappointment and just is out at here striping shots and making everything, uh, shoots a 64 in the first round. It really could have been a 62 mm. like bogey's the last to break the course record, uh, in the first round. Uh, this, of course, everyone's like, Oh my gosh, is it Tom Lehman's redemption story? Like, uh, you know, is he, is he finally going to win a major? I was sort of struck. So watching the video of this, like, if if you were trying to make the case that golf was cool, oh, 1996, Tom Lehman was a really tough bad sell. person to sort of do it. I mean, very kind of dumpy looking, you know, balding. Literally uh, the face of Dockers. Yeah. Like he was he yes. Dockers hat, Literally Docker wore, logo. Yes. Yeah. I mean, wearing like thirty dollar Dockers yeah. at this moment. Like if Greg Norman was like the the cool epitome yeah. of you know like cutting edge golfing fashion. Then Tom Lehman was like the dude who you still see at like your local Muni uh, in like the New Balance sneakers. I mean, he didn't wear New Balance, but like that kind of look of like, you know, a dad. Uh, and look, I'm a dad. I'll, uh, hopefully, you know, I, I have learned to dress a little bit better, but it was, it's the pleated khakis look. We can it's recognize the, not know, cool. As two not cool guys, we can yeah. recognize not cool. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and and this Tom Lehman's swing, you know, even it's like, I don't. I mean, you could not swing like that in today's professional game and win majors because it's like it's made for like hitting it yeah. straight. You know, it's getting the club three quarters back. It's, you know, bumping your hips and it's uh, it's flushing it. But it is not a kind of swing. I think that, you know, it's like a very unathletic John Rom in the sense of the club never really gets above his shoulder. Uh, anyway, um, remarkable. I'm going to sort of just skip ahead because I think like this is. We we kind of and knows you know if who ends up winning here it's Lehman but uh, what's remarkable I think about this is that we the ghost of the Masters is the ninety six Masters is still haunting us in a lot of ways because uh, Nick Faldo ends up he's a six shots back mm. uh, going into Sunday and everyone thinks like oh it's deja vu all over again like Nick is going to absolutely like walk this dude down Lehman had a sort of made a habit of of uh, you know, losing masters and stuff. And so, or excuse me, Lehman is, they've been in the habit of losing majors. And so everyone thinks like the absolute killer, Nick Faldo is going to go out and just run him down. And it's going to be, you know, the same old, same old. Uh, 
And I, did you know this? That Lithum starts with a par three. I, was, I can't remember that many majors that like have a par three. I, I, that, forgive my ignorance in that. But I've, um, I've played it a couple of times. Anyway. So yeah, I, I do remember. Oh, that. oh yeah. Okay. Well, okay. famously, oh, well, Ian Woosnam at the two thousand whatever the one Duval one. I forget what year that is. Two thousand two. He um, was trying multiple drivers out on the range, and uh, when oh, they get right. to the opening yeah. hole, the caddy would have noticed that there were two drivers in the bag but it's a par three. A so he stuffs it, hits it to like two feet and makes birdie and then get to two T and realize he has two drivers in the bag. Wow. Uh, what a good tidbit. Thank you for uh, refreshing us on that. Um, I'm just going to read though, as we get into uh, some of the writing back to stuff, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read a little bit from Riley's Gamer uh, here. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Tom Lehman is about as far from Norman as a man can get. Lehman never expected to be playing in a major, much less leading one. This is a man who has a deep working knowledge of the Dakotas tour, the Carolinas tour, and all the worn out fan belts and hoses in between. This is a man who was once so smelly and broke, and he couldn't afford a motel to take a shower in, so he pulled over his old Volvo behind a building, stripped to his shorts, and showered in a driving rainstorm. <laughs> Pretty good. Lo love to imagine Tom Wayman in the middle of Minnesota, just uh, you know, getting half naked, uh, showering in the rain. Uh, so, Layman is is sort of uh, you know he he feels like I'm gonna I can only control what I can control. Going into the final day, he he realizes you know Nick Faldo is Nick Faldo. He's obviously gonna make a run at me. Uh, I'm not gonna you know um, think about him. I'm not gonna watch him all day. I'm basically just gonna watch my own shots and. It doesn't actually work that great because Lehman comes out and is like not very good. The first thing doesn't make a birdie until the twelfth hole. Uh, Faldo makes a couple birdies early, starts to kind of walk him down. But really, one of the most interesting things is Fred Couples comes just screaming, uh, shoots a thirty on the front, uh, and just kind of blazes past Faldo and cuts the six-stroke lead to two by the time that Lehman uh, gets to the sixth hole. And then right after that, Ernie Els comes sort of screaming in, uh, you know, getting into within two of the lead. And actually, he gets to 13 under, which is what eventually will sort of uh, be the, the winning score. Uh, but Lehman, finally, when he gets to 12, he hits what he describes as his best shot of the week. Uh, he hits it to about 12 feet on the long par three there, makes it, third, makes it for birdie, uh, gives him a two-shot lead and sort of puts some, what is it, puts some air into his lungs. Freddie comes completely apart on the back, shoots a 41 on the back. Uh, and then what crazy if you sort of remember is that Litham, as, as you've played it many times, just enormous amount of bunkers. What, 100 and I think 89 or 250 something. 250 something, truly. 250 yeah. <laughs> bunkers. Okay. Uh, so Els is like has a chance like late in the round. Faldo, actually, his, his putter completely betrays him. Uh, and he's sort of slowly kind of fading, can't make anything. And, and one of the other things I sort of point out is in this – we always talk about how, you know, the, oh, the English fans sometimes like, or the European fans kind of are, are always knocking Americans for not being very classy for the fans. And in, in the rewatch of this are so pro Faldo, like it is just deafening. It is like completely like people are, are shouting. Uh, there's someone shouts something in uh, layman's backswing at some point, basically says like, nice putt, Greg, uh, knock it in oh. Greg. And, you know, it says they're sort of, you know, wanting this to come, come apart again. So, and, and a lot of people saying, remember Augusta, mm. you know, what each time Lehman steps over the ball. So not exactly the best look for the, uh, the English fans here, uh, as they, uh, sometimes like to lecture us about behavior sometimes warranted, but anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's a, probably a pretty kind of boring final round. Nothing really, uh, it, the theatrics don't really happen. It's just kind of like a, a battle of attrition. Layman plays, you know, well enough to win. Els has a chance if he makes birdie on 18 to sort of, um, to, to get into a tie, drives it into a pot bunker and basically has to go for it, hits it into the lip and it goes six feet forward. Like nothing, uh, sort of, you know, isn't going to happen. So then Layman's able to bogey 16 or bogey 17 and, and basically make a, you know, par on 18 to sort of, um, to win it. Uh, I, you know, I, I wish I had sort of, you know, it's something all that much more interesting. So I thought that was really funny in the press conference afterwards. Tom Lehman said that he feared 
that it would be written on his gravestone, Tom Lehman, he couldn't win the big one, which I was like, man, your family has to really hate you <laughs> if they put on your gravestone, Tom Lehman couldn't win the big one. Like, what a, what a, well, you know, dad, we really ought to honor the truth here is that you sucked and you couldn't win the big one. What so, I remember uh, most about dad and will never forget is how he never brought us home a major championship trophy. <laughs> But Lehman's first and only major, uh, famously, he becomes the number one player in the world, takes it away from Greg Norman and holds it for one week, the shortest uh, one week run as the, uh, I think we won the tour championship later that year, but the shortest one week run as the number one player in the world in history. Wow. Good for him. I was, I was happy after reading the 96 one uh, that knowing what comes next for him, um, it seems like it probably would have been a pretty popular win amongst American media at the time, I would think so. Yeah, it is remarkable how many um, like little digs Riley gets in at Nick Faldo because of his like love life. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like the the lead to the story is like to, to stand up to Nick Faldo. Uh, you, you know, you don't need a guy with seven Ferraris, five boats, two helicopters. Uh, you need a guy with a perfect with we, not a guy with a perfect swing or, or uh, clothes or a perfect chin. What you need is a kind of guy who looks like a rump roast on the outside, but it's tougher than a Woolworth steak on the inside. Someone who spent a lifetime trying to make a check at the Duluth Open, a guy wearing $35 Dockers, a guy with a bald spot and a happy Gilmore kind of lurch at the ball and a funny hitch in his neck that makes him look like he's in a limbo contest. What you need is a big boned Midwestern boy like 37 year old Tom Lehman who's never going to be in the centerfold of Golf Digest, but would be ju was just stubborn enough to hold off the unkillable Faldo. Oh, Jesus. That, yeah. There's like three references to Faldo's marriage falling apart and his relationship with uh, with Brianna, the uh, Arizona State, uh, Arizona golfer in this story. Hmm. I got, there's another steak joke coming up here shortly as we go to the 1996 oh, PGA it. Championship. Do you know where we're going? I have no idea. I pulled the Vulcan Hills out of my ass, but I, I am clu clueless on that. Valhalla one. for the first time. Valhalla Andy at Valhalla you. Valhalla at you. Uh, again, of course, there's a six minute like throwback highlight video on this. That's it. Okay. PGA of America, get it together. You know the drill here. There's a 24 minute no laying up video on Valhalla if you want it. Like four, we have four oh. X as much Valhalla content uh, up there as, wow. uh, as the PGA of America does. Come on, guys. Um, 7,100 yards, 2.4 million prize fund, 430 to the winner. First major played in Kentucky in 44 years. And then it is announced that week Valhalla is scheduled to return just four years later. Um, deservingly so. Who what? could say? Four years later. Yeah. And then, then we have the 2000 <laughs> uh, PGA with Bob May and Tiger Woods, one of the greatest yeah, majors that's ever. Right. Uh, see, it's a great golf course. Look at the leaderboard. Um, Mm -hmm. I love this little note. Jack Nicholas, who designed the course, uh, also played and missed the cut by a stroke at age 56. I just love the playing a major on a course you designed like blows my mind. Um, the thing where he was making changes to Augusta while he was playing it is like just like in his yeah. prime, kind of like in the early 80s is remarkable. To me. Uh, he also missed the cut by a stroke in uh, at in 2000 at age 60 in his final PGA. So missed the cut by a stroke twice at Valhalla. But a story quickly emerges in round one. Kentucky native Ke Kenny Perry opens with a 66 to take a one-shot lead over mm -hmm. Steve Elkington and Phil Mickelson. We have Mark Brooks, Russ Cochran, Joel Edwards, Lee Jansen, Greg Norman, Nick Price, and Ian Woosnam at four under par. Uh, jumping out to the th a three-shot lead after 36 holes is one young Phil Mickelson after another 67. Uh, Justin Leonard is in second alone at minus seven. Then Mark Brooks, Kenny Perry, and VJ Singh. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Remember this as a, one of the majors that Phil That's kind of pissed I away. wondered yeah. the exact same thing um, because he goes out and shoots 74 in round three. Uh, again, wild to think we're seven and a half years away from Phil winning his first major at this point. And 25 years away from him winning the PGA Championship in 2021. Like, Which I was going to say his last major, but no. may not be. Like, Phil could definitely, who knows, maybe Phil win at Hoylake. Maybe the, by the time you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> He's already Phil won. has won another major. <laughs> uh, another Kentucky native enters this way here. Uh, Russ Cochran, lefty. Another lefty shoots a course record 65 mm -hmm. to take a two-shot lead over Brooks. And VJ, uh, Mark Brooks, eagled the par for 15th, holding out from the fairway on this day. Uh, Phil goes into the final round, three shots back. Final round, Russ Cochran, ring him up, ejected hard, uh, arguing balls and strikes, shoots 77. It just wasn't working for uh, too much pressure in the final round. 
Tom Watson birdied six of the first 10 holes to get within two shots. Again, he's famously never won the PGA Championship. This was one last final charge, but he played the final eight holes and three over to finish 17th, so uh, did not win. Uh, But Kenny Perry re-emerges. He is draining birdies, fist pumping, getting the local crowd all riled up. He chips in for birdie on the 11th. He birdies 13. He birdies 14. It was his fifth birdie in seven holes. And he, Do it to he him, is Kenny. absolutely Do it to him. fucking jacked when he gets to 18T with a two-shot lead on the par five. Just about to wow. waltz into the clubhouse and strut up there and uh, sit in the clubhouse for a while after a victory. Uh, probably birdie the 18th, right? He drives yeah, it yeah. into the left rough. Um, he like hit, tries mm. to advance it out the left rough. It goes in the rough again. He's short of the green after, in three. Chips it past the hole. Has like a eight, uh, you know, an eight foot par putt, maybe a ten foot par putt. Doesn't come close, and he misses. He makes bogey on the final hole. So it was a one shot lead, uh, but as bogey eighteen, shot sixty eight, and waited as the clubhouse uh, leader. And what's about to happen uh, is is quite funny. Um, I never knew this, this next part, but, um, and the, uh, as an aside, there's, I have no evidence of this, but I, again, I had to read a couple of newspapers to find out that Steve Belkington missed a 15 foot birdie putt on the last hole that would have put him, uh, in what's about to happen, which is a playoff, uh, also tied with Tommy mm-hmm. tolls. I have no idea how Tommy tolls got there at all, but, uh, some very close calls <laughs> while you were yeah. away, Tommy tolls, <laughs> very close calls for Elk and Tommy tolls, but, um, Mark Brooks uh, drives drives in the fairway on 18. He's one back, goes for it in two, comes up short in the bunker, uh, but pitches out nicely to about five feet, drains the putt uh, to send it into a playoff to a very muted applause. The local fans not thrilled with the fact mm. that Kenny Perry um, will not have uh, won. But Kenny Perry, you know, finishes round the 30, uh, about 40 minutes ago at this point. Surely he's gotten uh, like a lot of, you know, he's probably, you know. Yeah, he's hitting some yeah. balls, right? Getting Do you know this? Do you know this part? Case. Okay, I, I did part. not remember this. <laughs> Kenny Perry spends over 30 minutes in the booth after his round doing commentary <laughs> instead of hitting balls. Um, this is from Jaime Diaz, who does the gamer for Sports Illustrated. He said, when network officials told him to feel free to leave the booth to practice shots in preparation for a probable playoff, Perry chose to stay, offering his comments as the last two groups finished. It was a neighborly choice, but not a move from the Nicholas School of How to Win a Major Championship. Uh, Perry said, I was caught, probably caught up in the moment, and I probably should have gotten my butt down there on the practice screen. But that television time was good for me. Good publicity. I've been, ar- I've been around 10 years out here, and shoot, nobody knows who I am. You know what also would have been awesome. good? Winning the PGA Championship. But, yes. <laughs> uh, again, having been in the television booth for nearly 40 minutes, he goes full Jack Nicholas on us. Perry asked for a chance to hit some practice balls, but after initially granting the request, PGA of America officials changed their minds and told Perry to go directly to the 18th tee for the start of the playoff. Um, Oh, that's kind of shitty. Like, they could have let it have a few swings out there. And although Perry was within his rights to insist on being allowed to warm up, he deferred to the officials who were being pressured by CBS and the threat of lightning. Fucking CBS. Mm. Um, He pulls his drive again in the thick Kentucky bluegrass, tries to chop it out, uh, finds more rough down the left, and uh, Brooks would go on to birdie somehow. We don't have the video. I don't know how it happens, but he makes birdie and beats (laughs) beats the hometown kid in the playoff. Uh, Brooks was absolutely electric afterwards saying, I don't think things will change a lot for me. Uh, I don't know what you want me to say. I was taught a long time ago that if you drop your guard, the other guy knows what's going on. So I try not to drop my guard, uh, just like refusing to give the media basically anything afterward. So, Oh, cool. Very nice. I'm sure that worked out well for Brooks. Maybe he should have gone into the uh, like booth and done a little commentary. <laughs> we, we certainly remember Kenny Perry better than Mark Brooks. Um, uh, Mark Brooks was actually in the mix at a lot of those. Uh, yeah, he lost in a majors. playoff of the U.S. Open at Southern Hills a few years later as well. But um, mm-hmm. Jaime Diaz writes, Brooks's lack of emotion was fitting because the PGA of Valhalla didn't deliver on any of the several fairy tales that it had promised. Uh, the sweetest might have been Tom Watson, who at 46 was making a last-ditch effort to win his first PGA. Um, Nick Price had his own inspira- inspirational tale spurred on as he was by his longtime caddy, Jeff Squeaky Medlin, who earlier this year learned that he had leukemia. Uh, for a long time, look at Valhalla would be the site of Phil's first major victory, uh, but uh, that did not happen. The cruelest dream dashed, however, belonged to Perry, who lives three hours from Louisville and Franklin. A three-time winner in his 11 years on tour, he bolted out of a large pack of final day contenders with five birdies on the first 14 holes. Perry is considered a superior driver, but when it came time to plant a serviceable tee shot in the wide fairway of the 540-yard par 5 18th, he was overwhelmed by the magnitude of this possible victory. 
His backswing put his driver in a familiar slot at the top, but Perry rushed his forward swing and hit a horrible duck hook. His ball dived down a steep embankment overgrown with bluegrass. The crowd, uh, Perry would say, the crowd was going ballistic and my heart was racing. Uh, he couldn't get over the fact that so many people were rooting for him. He said, I was so excited, so nervous, I just overswung the club. Uh, his eight iron recovery stayed in the rough, third shot, missed the green, and then he missed the putt. Um, and then after the playoff, Perry walked past the gallery behind the 18th green in shock. For the first time all week, he didn't stop to sign autographs. Uh, kind of sounds like blocky a little bit after the after this round. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> he, his caddy said he played so well, he just found himself in a whole new place mentally on that 18th tee, which is a bad time to do that. But Oh, man. Uh, Kenny Berry kind of blew two well, majors. Getting, you know, going to warm up to that. Um, it was probably a place Perry never thought he would be when he, uh, when he said after winning the 95 Bob Hope Classic that he planned to stop playing the tour soon so he could devote time to his wife and three children and to operating Country Creek, a public course that he owns in Franklin. If he didn't know it then, Perry knows now that he has the game to win a major. He said, this was good for my career. I'll be remembered for this. Uh <laughs> unfortunately it's unfortunately true, true. Uh, <laughs> Perry would go on to lose the 2009 Masters in a playoff after making bogey on both the 71st and 72nd holes and the second playoff hole um, Dave Hackenberg I believe for an Ohio paper wrote uh, you got to hand it to Mark Brooks Kenny Perry did um, ooh, ooh. under the headline <laughs> Perry's not ready for primetime Bob Verde of the Chicago Tribune said You've got to hand yeah. it to Mark Brooks, and Kenny Perry did. Uh, so a popular Ooh. line. Uh, also said that Brooks was tougher than a $2 steak and said that Perry uh, showed the killer instinct of a ladybug, which was sick. Um, he Ooh. finished it by saying this year's field was the best of any major, and Kenny Perry had it whipped, but he wasn't ready for prime time, though he went on television anyways. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> It's so funny to think about, like, I would love to sit and watch the YouTube clip of Kenny Perry, like, yeah. talking and talking and talking for 30, 40 minutes in the booth there. Uh, and, like, Johnny suggesting or whatever, like, you know, you might want to go down or CBS, or whoever so it's like Nance and CBS, I like his color at that point. But, yeah. But, like, hey, like, do you want to go down and, you know, hit some? Uh, I feel like it was. Um, it was Ken Venturi. Yeah, been, yeah. I feel like the reading, I remember years that Ken, Ken was like, Hey, you know, maybe do you want to go hit some shots? Like you want to go warm up or whatever? Because I mean, he had obviously played really high level golf and uh, that's hilarious. Because I'd always, I mean, I, I don't remember seeing it. I don't remember that all, but I remember jokes for years about mm. Kenny Perry sitting in the TV tower when he should have been uh, out hitting balls. God, imagine range. that happening. I remember like when Joaquin Neiman didn't do it at the um, at the Century at the Tournament Champions a couple years ago, but it was he was just like out sitting on a picnic table and they were like crushing him for that, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like nearly this time frame and it wasn't a major championship and it, like you had to go take a cart down to the, it was a different scenario, but yeah, I imagine that happening yeah. uh, these days is, is pretty tough, but so I remember when uh, Tommy, when Tommy fleet would shut that 63 at Shinnecock, I, my job that day was to follow him around, like whatever he did. And he was the only guy on the range just sort of standing there. And I remember a USGA guy came like running across and put the little like place card for his name, you know, it had just says who's hitting or whatever. I thought that was such a funny <laughs> detail. Well, we got to make sure we put the, uh, the Mr. Fleetwood up here. <laughs> I I regret to inform you, Kevin. It kind of mm. dawned. It didn't really dawn on me until we got uh, when I wrapped this one up. This marks the end yeah. of where we initially set out with this series of kind of pre Tiger nineties uh, era. era. Um, I think we started with two thousand nine to twenty twelve when we started doing these. Um, mm -hmm. And we're back when we tried to do four in one up, uh, four years in one episode, we learned we talk way too much for yeah. that. But uh, yeah. I think we do keep going. I think we can. Uh, the Tiger ones will be yeah. will still obviously be interesting. But um, of course, we, we've covered them, and in, in we've you know covered a lot of Tigers majors over the years in, in formats like this. But worth redoing because over time it it wears. Yeah. And uh, gosh, these are really fun. Well, think about yeah, they are. Really fun. Think about now, like somebody who's thirty years old. You know, they were seven yeah. when Tiger Woods won the. You know, uh, or excuse me, they were no, no, it's less than that. They were so. What, what does it make them? They're, they're thirty now. They're yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> messing up the math here. That's, they're young. I've been out in the sun young. all day with golf. Uh, yeah, super young. Like that's. I think it was worth revisiting. Uh, and like just reading all of the newspaper stuff leading up to it, and yeah. watching some of the footage stuff. I mean, like to remember like what a phenomenon Tiger Woods was. I think it'd be fun for a lot of people uh who weren't didn't really get to witness it uh firsthand because I was, you know, a freshman in college and you were in grade school, whatever. So 
Like, which, listen, I, I gave you ninety six masters. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call for the ball. You're gonna I'm take, gonna take 97. ninety seven. I won okay. ninety seven. I want that okay. one. Uh, I'm gonna take that one. I love You're it. You're gonna get right. congressional uh, for for uh, U.S. Open, which I think was <laughs> there's some. I think there's some layman stuff in that one too, if I remember right. So I look forward to that one. It'd be fun. You, I'm gonna. Well, you get to do 97 Masters, but I'll. I'm gonna come in and offer a few uh, uh, addendums afterwards, anyway, because it's such a big cultural event. I love it. So, so. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for this. A lot of work and research goes into these. I know it's big time commitment. We greatly appreciate. We thank everyone for listening and encouraging us to do these because they are a lot of fun to do. So we'll be back next time with 1997. Love this. Love you. Uh, let's uh, let's do this Cheers. again soon.